Loving. The best. Beautiful. Radiant. That we love about our mom is that she's selfless, she's caring. What I love about my mother is that I get to bake with her. Honest, lovely, courageous, reliable, helpful. And supportive of what you do. Uh, I love my mom because she plays video games with us. Um, I love my mom because she's really cheerful. Happy, Happy Mother's, Mother's Day. Day! Happy Mother's Day. Happy, Happy Mother's, Mother's Day. Day! Love you. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day! Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day! My name is Penny. Hi, my name is Gacy. And our, our mommy is Pastor B. Yep, she's Pastor B. Yeah, those are my kids! Happy Mother's Day! Oh my goodness, my name is Pastor V. I am the campus pastor for New Carlisle, but I get to hang out with you today. So I'm so glad to be here. Man, oh man, there's a lot of you. It's good to see you. Yep, those are my Goober kids. I love them so much. I love that they said she plays video games with, with us because really it's them playing video games with me. So I'm glad they see it that way, you know, because, you know, I have to get my Fortnite on. But, um, Good to see you this morning. Man, has this series not been ama amazing? The Bible for grown-ups. Been able to just kind of walk in and break apart the word and really look at it and make it a part of ourselves. Pastor Andy, he is such an incredible pastor. Would you give him a round of applause? <laughs> his leadership, so grateful for it. But even with him and his amazing preaching, we should never take his word for it, right? Because ultimately what we are is we're flesh and bone and we make mistakes. But what we want as a pastoral staff is for you to take the word of God and for you to dive into it, tear it apart, make it a part of you. Always keep us accountable. My favorite thing back in the day where Tammy, Tammy can you give a round of applause for Tammy running Pro Presenter? She's so stinking awesome. It's like one of my favorite people. But when I would run Pro Presenter, and then it was always Jackson Tittle would come up and go, hey, that verse was wrong. That was up there. That's so exciting for us because we know what? You're opening up your Bible, right? So if you haven't gotten one of these books of Luke, you need to make sure you get one. We've had a basket out there. Take it. Make sure you have a pen today because we want you to write in it and kind of underline, circle things that really stick out to you. I know as an ex-Catholic that that is a little bit overwhelming. Because I remember the first time someone said, hey, you can write in your Bible. And I'm like, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> we don't do that. It's a very beautiful book that we put on our coffee table that no one touches. We just <laughs> blow the dust off of it once in a while. But I'm saying that that is your textbook. God has given you a roadmap for how you can live your life. So take it, write in it, write notes. If you don't understand something, circle it, write a note next to it, and look it up. Or sometimes when things are like, they're a warning, I'll put a square around it so that I'm reminded that that is not what I should do, right? But we've got this incredible series, and we started it off with this question. Is the example of your life preparing people for God's purpose? Reminds me of 1 Corinthians 11.1 1 that says, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. How are you following Christ's example? Right? Because people know that you're a Christian. They hopefully do. They can see the fruit of it from you. But ultimately, when we come into that place, when we invite someone to church, there is that realization that, uh, how have I been living my life? Even when you drove here today, if you were 
irritated with somebody who was going too slow and happened to use words that did not edify but tore down, and possibly a gesture from your hand that may not have been like a, hey, good to see you, neighbor, but showed your discourse that that is fruit. Ultimately, the great thing is, is that God knows we're not perfect. That's why he sent Jesus, because we needed him. We needed not only his example on this earth, but he was broken for us so that we can have eternal life with him. So it is so amazing to be able to ask that question. The first week, Pastor Andy put us in a high chair, put a bib on us, and he taught us how to eat, right? Remember that? Eat. We're going to examine the word. We're going to look at it, apply it put it as a part of our lives, and then we're going to let that word transform us. It's going to change our behavior. And then in week two, he gave us a very, very important special ingredient. You remember the chocolate cake? Does anybody remember that chocolate cake? Dude, that chocolate cake I, in New Carlisle, it looked <laughs> legit. I was like, these are the moments where I wish I was back here at this campus because when we got done with that sermon series, I would cut that cake and eat it. So <laughs> I'm just saying... But we had this special ingredient, and it was patience, right? Patience is the active ingredient in our faith. It's what builds our faith. So today, we're going to take all of this that we've done so far, and we're going to put it into practice. We're going to do this, and we're going to look at the practice of doing what we knew we should do leads to full dependence on God. Now, I say what we know we should do because there's a lot of things that we know we should do, but we don't do them, right? Right? So, like, I know that when my husband irritates me, that I should first go to the throne room and spend time with the Lord <laughs> and allow God to transform my mind, right? You know, as I take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. But that's not always what I do right? We know the things that we should do, but we don't always do them. But when we do, it builds obedience. And God does incredible things. So we're going to look at an incredible miracle. Now, Jesus did a lot of miracles that were one-on-one. -on -one. He'd spit in mud and put it on people's eyes. That one is one of my favorites because I'm like, <laughs> you're desperate for a healing, so you'll do whatever, right? But he's like, hold on. Can you see? No, let's do that again. <laughs> you know, like, they look like trees. Like, oh, you know, at that point you could see, so you probably don't care. But he did a lot of one on one miracles or sometimes with small groups. But this miracle is so incredible because he takes 12 people and he utilizes them to extrapolate a miracle that reaches 5,000 plus people. That's incredible to think about. That these are. Just ordinary guys that he uses, and he says, he tells them to do something that then they feed over 5,000 people. At the end of this miracle, I'll give you the spo spoiler alert, I'll give you the end. It says this in Luke 9, 17, and they all ate and were satisfied. And what was left over was picked up 12 baskets of broken pieces. I'm going to say this, I'm going to make this comment, there's something about leftovers like, when I say that, you have a visceral response. Leftovers means something to everybody. If they're Chipotle leftovers, we get really, really excited. If it's leftovers in our house, we're like, mm, I don't know how long they've been there. But there's something <laughs> about leftovers. Let's take a moment to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, you are awesome in the way that you move and work. God, we want to take the little bit that we have and present it to you and allow you to do something incredible because you're the God of the impossible. And so, Lord, I present the little that I have and ask that you would extrapolate it and make it a miracle. God, would you take the words that we have, you have for us today, remove any distractions, any obstacles, so that we can just hone in on what your word has to say. We love you, Lord. It's in your name we pray. And everybody shouted, Amen. All right. So in this Bible for grownups, I felt like we should have a moment where we become theologians as I adjust my glasses to make it sound like I'm so much smarter and add an accent. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to learn two words that whenever you're at your next like small group, you, everybody's in a victory life group, right? That should be a yes. So next week when Pastor Andy goes, everybody's in a victory life group, everybody goes, yeah. 
us because everybody's in one because if you're not in one, you need to get in one. This is how we live life. We need to live life together. We're not supposed to do this on our own. And you need to be around other like-minded people who are walking and trudging through this together. So in your next life group, you can sound so very, very, very smart when you use these two words that we're going to use to really look at the word. And the first word is exegesis. Can you say exegesis? Can you say it with an accent? Oh, that was so lovely. It's delightful. Spot a tea, please. Exegesis, when I think exegesis, the way I remember it is to excavate, almost like an archaeologist. You're going to look at the word, and you're going to kind of like brush the dirt to the side and, and really look at the fossil, take it out of the earth, and you're going to think about the time, figure out the time that it was there and what was going on in that moment. You don't add to it. You don't paint it. I don't think the Museum of Natural History would be okay if we painted fossils. No, we want to look at it how it is and what that means in that time and what it was. That is what exegesis is. The next word we're gonna learn is eisegesis. Can you say eisegesis? Can you say it with an accent? Eisegesis, very, very lovely. So that means I see Jesus, okay? What we are doing now is you're taking you, your life experience, and you're applying it into the word. You're taking your hurts, your pain, your life, what you've walked through, the community you lived in, and you're looking at it through that lens. And so just to, so we get a little bit of a feel of how it works, there's a promise in Jeremiah 29, 11 that many of you have heard. It says this, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans for a hope and a future. That's a promise that I've heard all my life. I've heard that promise. And the promises of God they're for you as well. And in moments when you spend time in prayer and time in the word, God will go boom and highlight that. He won't literally go boom. He, he doesn't do that. But he will highlight that verse and you'll see it and you'll go, that promise. He'll say that promise is for you for right now. And so the exegesis of this verse is this. The moment that this was spoken, the Israelites were going to step into, not out of, but step into 70 years of exile. There's a whole lot of incredible text that goes around it, and I want to encourage you to read Jeremiah 29, 11, because it makes the verse so much powerful, because you realize they're stepping into 70 years. We don't like four minutes of pain. I don't like going to the dentist and sit there for an hour in pain. But they're walking through 70 years of exile, and he makes this promise. The eisegesis, when I apply it, is that when I'm in this zone, whatever you're walking through, when your heart is broken, whatever may be going inside your lives, that that promise is from you, that God is saying, I have plans for you, Veronica, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Though you're walking through this rough season, I see you. That's the eisegesis. Are we catching it? Does that make sense? Look, Pastor Andy is here, but you get, it's okay. You can talk with me, all right? Do you get it? There we go. Now I know you got it. All right, we're going to go into Luke 6. We're going to look at this. But before we step into that, and you're kind of getting your Luke journals ready, we're going to step directly into my kitchen at my home because my home looks very much like this. It's very spacious and lovely. And I've invited all of you, even those in the lobby and everybody online, to step into my house Welcome and come into my kitchen because I'm sure you're very, very hungry and I want to make sure that I feed you. Has anybody watched the Netflix show, The Best Leftovers Ever? No? Okay, so now you guys got something to binge watch. First read your Bible, then binge watch. Anyway, Best Leftovers Ever is where they take three chefs, present leftovers in front of them, like literally like from your like chewed leftovers. And then it is, it's kind of, you're like, ew. But, um, but then they take it and they make it into a gourmet meal. So one example was this leftover pad thai noodles that they turned into a gourmet mac and cheese. I was like, what in the world? Never would have done that. But anyway, that's what they do in that show. However, my kitchen is not like the best leftovers ever. Instead, what normally happens on a Wednesday night is that we get ready, the kids are gonna go either to soccer practice or they have dance class, and we need to feed them before they leave out the door. And I have that moment where I go, oh no, I didn't put anything in the crock pot, I thawed no meat. <laughs> what are we gonna eat? We've already had spaghetti five times this week. And um, 
Dan will look at me, my lovely, handsome, incredible man, who's full of wisdom, but is very cheap. Like, he's really cheap. So I'm going to go off script a little bit. This is how cheap he is, because somebody came up and tried to defend him last service, and I appreciate them, but this is how cheap he is. So he has shoes. <laughs> Some of the staff have seen this before. He has these shoes. Every pair of shoes he has, no joke, has a hole in the bottom of the shoes. Now, can we afford to go get new shoes? Yes, we can go get new shoes. But he's like, no, the kids need shorts. No, the kids need blah, blah. I'm like, we can get you a pair of shoes. Anyway, so when it rained on Thursday night, it was raining, and he came in in his work shoes. And as he's walking through the parking lot, he's walking like this. <laughs> So then he's like, I'm going to go to the sound booth and I'm going to get some gaff tape so I can put something in the hole. <laughs> and I'm like, Dan, can we just get you some? No, 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 no. I don't need shoes. I don't need shoes. And so, uh, yeah, he's that cheap. I've never met anybody in my life who actually wore their shoes down to the point where they have holes in them. Anyway, as I digress, my cheap husband, who's very handsome, attractive with blue eyes, will look at me and say, you know what? And as I'm in my heart thinking, this is the point where he's going to say taco boxes for everybody. And it will just save the day. He says, but what about the leftovers? And I go, <laughs> as my heart breaks in half, I open the refrigerator, and this is what I find. Broccoli from last week. Mm-hmm. Can't wait to crack that seal. It's going to smell so good. So one of those smells that you don't forget. I, the last church I worked at, the pastor had a rule that you could not cook leftover broccoli because it smells so bad. All right. And then I go, oh, a little bit of spaghetti. So my amazing 12-year-old daughter, Penelope, made the spaghetti. It was her first time doing it. She made it for us on Thursday last week, and she boiled it for about 45 minutes. So <laughs> when we first ate it, it was very big and spongy so you know a week plus it's going to be really good and then we have one meatball in a giant tupperware container i don't know about your family we do this all the time it's whatever is closest and then i'm going to see if this service it will do it oh a little bit there's some movement because when i walked it from the back to the front and during last service that meatball did not move at all so that's what we got. Broccoli, which I love, but it's a little old, spaghetti, and a meatball. What if Jesus took this, just this little, it's just little insignificant meal and extrapolated it so that all of us could eat today full, right? Here's the thing, is that these ingredients are gross. They're not great. But he is the Lord of the impossible, and he can do anything, and we're going to see him do that. But before we can understand that portion of the miracle, we have to go back to what the meal was prior. So in Luke 6, it is this point where we hear about the disciples, okay? We heard about last week the calling of Peter. Remember that very significant moment where Jesus comes to Peter, and he's talking, and then he says, hey, put your nets in the water. He's like, dude, we already did that all night, but he gives him a very juicy, crucial, amazing, beautiful, big but. But at your word, I'll do it, puts it in, and then the nets are breaking, the, water, the fish are all, and then he goes, oh, Lord, I'm so not worthy, and he's called. In this moment, in Luke 6, it says this, in the days he went out to the mountain to pray, and all night he continued to pray to God. This is an crucial moment in Jesus' ministry because he's been doing these healings, and all these crowds are, are coming, and they want to see him, but these crowds weigh in two different ways. We have crowds that are really desperate for a miracle, and we have crowds that are ready to see a show. They're fickle. They're fickle crowds, and then He's also dealing with offended leaders. He's offending everybody who's religious. So he has fickle crowds and offended leaders, and he's about to make an important decision. He's about to set an example for us. And that example is when you have big things that are going to happen in your life, big decisions, big choices, you're going to step into big places, spend time on the mountaintop with your Lord. Seek him first. Talk to him first. Ask for his advice first because all wisdom and authority flows through him. So why would we go to someone else when we can go directly to the source? 
So he sets that example. In 13, it says this, and when the day came, he called the disciples and chose 12 whom he named apostles. So get your pen out, circle that disciple, circle that apostle. Two different words, right? Now, disciple means this, a student learner. Oh, all of you are disciples. Isn't that exciting? When we choose to follow Jesus, we become his disciple. I want to be covered in the dust of the rabbi. That's what they used to say then, is that when you were following the rabbi, that you were following him so closely that you were covered in his dust. I want to be covered in the dust of Jesus. I want to be soaked in his dust. And then we have the apostles who are messengers, one who are sent on a mission. So we have disciples, apostles, who's taking 12 disciples, and he's about to send them out on this mission. Here are their names. We've got Math, or sorry, we've got Simon, who is, whom he named Peter. We heard about him last week, and Andrew, so they're brothers. Then James and John, who are the sons of thunder. Now, I will tell you this. If I were a man, and I was as big as Pastor Andy, and I had a brother who happened to be as big as Pastor Andy, we would be in the WWE, and we would be called the Sons of Thunder. <laughs> and it would be so awesome, because you would walk in, and it would go dark. <laughs> Lights come up, and then the smoke, and they're like, Sons of Thunder. That would be my dream come true. <laughs> There's a reason why I'm Veronica Moorhead. <laughs> and not a son of sons of thunder. <laughs> All right, and then moving on, we've got, uh, we've got Philip and Bartholomew, who's also called Nathan, which is good, because how many Bartholomews do you know in this world? I only know one, one Bart. And then we have, in 15, Matthew, who's also known as Levi, and Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who was a zealot, and so the zealots were very hungry for the Messiah's return, but they wanted to do it in power. They, they hated Rome, and they wanted to take Rome out. Then we have Judas, the son of James, who's also known as Thaddeus in Mark 3.18, and then Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. History writes. This is true story. He became a traitor. What set of words would be behind your name? If I had to describe you, like if, if we were writing the Bible now and, and we were writing and it said Veronica blank, 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 what would follow that? That's something that we need to think about. That's that example that we talked about. Follow my example as I follow Christ. And so it reminds me of this really cool story of a theologian who's sitting in his office and he's sitting there waiting and getting ready for, for whatever class he has. And a student busts through the doors, and he's like, I need to talk to you. I cannot, I'm wrestling. I'm wrestling with this question, and I don't understand why. Why did Judas choose, or why did Jesus choose Judas? And the theologian thinks, and he's pondering, and he's rubbing his chin, because that's what really smart people do to make it look like they're thinking. And he looks at him, and he says, I don't know. But I have an even bigger question, a heavier question. Why did he choose me? I don't know about your story, but I know mine. Prior to God being the Lord of my life, prior to accepting Jesus as my Lord and Savior, I was not a good person. I was mean, rude, vindictive, backstabbing, ugly. I was broken, hurt, angry, mad at life. I felt like if I did good things, God would bless me, but if I did bad things, he would just smite me. And I had a lot of smiting, smoting. I don't know how the plural there, but it's, he was getting me. And I was thinking, that's the reason why, is because I'm doing bad stuff, so God's not going to do any, and that's not how it works. That's not how it works at all, because when I surrendered my life to Christ, and I gave everything I had, I just surrendered my life and will over to the care of God. Oh, my word. I was a new creation. That's why it says you're a new creation. The old is gone, the new is here. So who you were is not who you are now. And you should not have, oh, this is, this is totally on a side. I'm kind of getting off track. Who you are is who you are not now. 
and you should not allow yourselves to be chained to the person that you were before because God has written a new name for you. He has made you new. You have been reborn as if you were an infant coming back out. That's why we have to learn how to eat, right? So I want you to catch that. Don't chain yourself to the things that you were before and don't allow this world to do that to you. That was the Lord. So moving on, moving on, in Luke 8, we have this really cool moment because sometimes when we preach about the disciples and the apostles, we miss out on the ladies. And there were ladies that followed, not like that. I didn't, sorry, it came out like that. <laughs> ladies. There were ladies that followed Jesus too. So in Luke 8, it says this, soon afterward, he went through the cities and the villages proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God and the 12 were with him. Two, it says, and also some women. Where my girls at? From the front, the back, you know I'm feeling that? Mm, it was not a Christian song. <laughs> so do not Spotify that guy. <laughs> and as I'm processing it again, because I've done it every service going, what is the rest of that song? And I'm, anyway, God will, the Holy Spirit will clear it out. Uh, who had healed, okay, so we've got some women who've been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. They experienced this powerful healing of God. So we have Mary called Magdalene, whom seven demons had gone out of her. Now, just so you know, religious history writes Mary Magdalene in a very different way. This is the eisegesis. This is what happened. She had seven demons taken out of her. And sometimes we will flip things around and try to make a really good documentary story. The History Channel, oh my gosh, they love to write, rewrite history and make it something way more provocative than it is. Really, this is who she is, a woman who was healed, drastically, amazingly healed. And then we have Joanna, the wife of Chusa, who is a part of Herod's court. She is a lady of the court. And Susanna and many others who provided out of their means. What's the exegesis in this? Let's look at this. It was so unusual for this to happen. Women did not follow rabbis. Jesus is seen as a rabbi in many ways. And women did not do that. They were given lowly positions. You don't need to know about this religious stuff. Just listen to what your husband says. Magdalene, who had demons cast out of her. And then we have Joanna, who is part of Herod's court. Those two would never be together. But they're living together, they're walking together, they're following Jesus together. And guess who was the first to see him at the resurrection? Come on, ladies. It wasn't the men. The ladies were there. So let's give it up for them because they are huge examples and we can skate over them. And as a woman who has been called into ministry, it wasn't until I started to really look at those ladies and go, what? Here's the eisegesis. He calls everybody. He calls everybody everybody. And so we've got this moment where we meet these women. We're moving into Luke 9 now. It's really on you to read all the other stuff in between. Dive into it. In Luke 9, we're about to step into this miracle, but something happens right before it. He calls the 12 together, and he gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. And they sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. And he said to them, take nothing for your journey, no staff, no bag, no bread, no money, and do not have two tunics. What you're wearing is what you got. What does that tell us? When God calls, we need to move quickly, and we need to pack light. There's a lot of times where we're like, God will tell you to do something. He will, you have that moment where you feel like you have that impression, like, I'm supposed to do this. That is God speaking to you. And in those moments, be a Samuel and say, yes, God, I'm here. What is it that you want to say? And those times where God will ask you to do things that are so bizarre that you're like, <laughs> uh, no, I'm not doing that. And you'll wrestle with him and wrestle. And then finally, if you step into obedience, you get to see the miracle that happens. But sometimes we don't even, we just say no. And he has to use somebody else. In this moment, he's calling these disciples and he's saying, you know what? We need to go. You need to move quickly and pack light. It says this in four, and whatever house you stay in, Enter or enter, stay there, and from there depart. So there is no Airbnb reservations. They are literally walking into places going, okay, Lord, oh, we're staying here. And whenever they do not receive you, when you leave the town, shake the dust from your feet as a testimony against them. This is, again, Jesus rewriting social norms because rabbis used to do this with Gentile cities. So Gentiles are everybody who's not Jewish. 
everybody who's not religious, right? So they would walk through these cities, and at the edge of the city, they would shake the dust off because they didn't want it on them. They, it's the people that don't look like me, act like me. Oh, we can, come, we can come down home with this moment because we have these moments, right? I don't even want that filth on me. Jesus is sending them into Jewish cities and saying, if they don't receive you, if they don't receive me, shake it off. That's pretty powerful. Because as a religious leader, you're saying, what, what, what? You know, like, what are you trying to say? And Jesus is saying, look, everybody, he's, he's now rewriting things. We're going to get into this, everybody, the doors are open for everybody. And slowly, he's getting us there. So then, it says in 10, and when they returned, the apostles told him everything they had done, and he took them and withdrew to the part of town called Bethsaida. I'm going to tell you this, that absolute dependence on God requires absolute dependence, right? They walked, they saw what happened, they, had, they were casting out demons, they were healing people, they were staying in people's homes that they hadn't really thought about before. They brought nothing with them but were provided everything. That's what God does when we step into absolute dependence with him. But we got to do it. And so they retire. And Jesus is showing us here that when we have those moments where we pour ourselves out, there's times where you need to be refilled. In 11, it says, when the crowds learned about it, they followed him and welcomed him, and, or welcomed them, spoke to them of the kingdom of God, and he cured those who were in need of a healing. Okay, so here we go. It's getting excited because we're about to have this amazing miracle happen. Now the day began to wear away, and the twelve came to him and said, Send the crowds away to go to the surrounding villages and countryside to find lodging and to get provisions, for we are here in a desolate place. What does that remind you of? Let's go back to last week, 40 days in the desert. What are some of the things that Pastor Andy said last week? All this stuff is interlinked, okay? Is that it's when we're in the desert, it's when we're in those desolate places that we find full dependence on God. That's what Jesus modeled for us. And so the disciples said, we're in a desolate place. They need to go to like Dayton where they can get a meal, or, you know. And he's like, mm-mm. He gives them a response that is so powerful. He says, you give them something to eat. Now remember, all power, all authority was given to them prior, right, to a, a totally different situation, but it wasn't taken away. All power and authority was given to them. All power and authority is given to you. The moment you accept Jesus, the power of the resurrection is inside of you. The think about that. The power of breaking the bonds of death is inside of you. All power, all authority. Watch how they respond. And they did so. It doesn't say they argued. It doesn't say they hemmed and hawed. Instead, what they did, because there's a moment they said, you know, all we have is five loaves and two fish unless we're to go and buy food for all these people. But I'm telling you, with all of you, it's not my day's pay is never going to pay enough to feed all of you. It's impossible. So think 5,000, but really it's 5,000 men not counting the women and children. So we've got this just ginormous number. And so they did so, and they had them sit. He's going to tell them. He tells them this in 14. He says, for there were about 5,000 men, and he said to the disciples, have them sit in groups of 50 each. Please remember that God has given all the power and authority to them, and they responded by just saying yes. Now the nerd hat comes on, because I am a nerd, and I'm very proud of it. I'm a nerd. My husband was a jock. I don't know how we got together. That's what happens when you get older. But as a nerd, I go, wow. So let's just say it's just 5,000 people, 50 groups eat. How many groups do we see? How many groups of people? You can shout it out. A hundred. A hundred groups of 50. That's a lot of people. That's a ton of people. That reminds me, as they do that, that the practice of surrender to God, even when it doesn't make sense, is obedience, and it builds our faith. There are things that God will ask you to do that don't make sense. If we do them, that's what helps build our faith, that patience and that obedience. So 16, he does this. He takes the five loaves and the fish. He looks to heaven, the one who provided it. 
And every good and perfect gift comes to the Father from heavenly lights, who does not change like the shifting shadows. Every good and perfect gift. In this moment, we're going to see five loaves and two fish become perfect. And he says a blessing over them, and he breaks the loaves, and he gives them, gives them to the disciples to set before the crowds. And it says, all eight and we're satisfied. And what was left over was 12 baskets of broken pieces. John 6, 12 says it this way. And when they had eaten their fill, so this is not like I had a crumb. <laughs> I was a professional dancer. So <laughs> I used to be around these people all the time. And they would like eat a crumb and go, oh, I'm so full. And it's like, I think I get some steak. Um, but they ate to their fill and were satisfied. And what was left over? 12 bags. It says in, in 612, I'm sorry, to gather up the leftover fragments so nothing can be lost. Why? Because there is no waste in God's kingdom. Nothing is wasted. He is the God of recycling. He takes every broken piece and he reuses it and he renews it. He uses it for restoration. He will use every broken piece. There is no waste. There is no leftovers. Because every leftover is so essential and important. Do you think it's crazy that there's 12 baskets for them as we eisegesis it and we step in to see 12 baskets of filled with broken pieces. Even if I took a basket right now and broke that amount of food, I would never fill a basket. That is what God does. He wastes nothing. He's not in the business of it. And whatever is inside of your life, whatever you walk through, because every person here is a testimony. He will use it, no matter how insignificant you think it is. Because he gives significance to our insignificance. It reminds me of this time where later, and something we celebrate every month is communion. And there's something that Jesus said. He took the bread, and he broke it, and he gave thanks. And he said, take this and eat. This is my body. It's given unto you. Do this in remembrance of me. Broken body. He broke his body for us. You are a basket of 12, or t you are a basket of broken pieces. And I, I, I'm telling you that I understand that from the depths of who I am. And those 12 basketfuls would continue. They could feed more people. So what are you doing with your basket of broken pieces? I know that Mother's Day and just sharing with, as Angela shared, that I have two incredible kids on this planet and three children that are in glory with God. One that I got to deliver and say goodbye to. But I remember the morning that I was going to go to the hospital and a friend texted me and she said, God is close to the brokenhearted and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. And as I was preparing and waiting to deliver, in my mind, I had written that scripture all over the walls because I was so crushed that I knew that God couldn't be any closer to me than that moment. And as we left the hospital, my husband and I took a week to mourn and it drew our cl marriage closer together because we allowed ourselves to cry when we needed to cry and laugh when we needed to laugh. And then one week later, I get a call from a friend that she had miscarried. And then another call from another friend who'd miscarried. And then another miscarriage. God had taken literally just that piece that my friend Jamie had given me. God is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who crush in spirit. And I was able to feed three women who were walking through the worst pain that they'd ever experienced in their life. He uses everything. Do not negate the miracles that God has done. We can do that. We go, well, it's not as important as that person's. You know, like, don't do that. Because everything that you walk through, is there's a reason that God can use it. And it's because he's the God of the impossible. The healing that you've received, you can then extrapolate not only to one person, but to another family and another family, and then generation curses are broken. There's a reason why every time Dan preaches, I say, you need to tell them that you were an alcoholic. Why? 
because he looks really good. He's a good looking man. <laughs> but he has been miraculously healed and people need to know that. That he cleans up really good, but that this is real because God has done a work in him. So would you stand as I close this morning? What little do you have that God wants to use? I think in this room and even in the lobby online, there's a lot. There's this little that we have. And I think there's, I really felt impressed this weekend that there are people here that God has been speaking to and talking to and saying, I want you to do this, but you were like, mm, not me, Lord. That was for her. Or not me, Lord, that was for them. Or not me, Lord, that's for Pastor Andy. But I'm telling you that in this moment, God wants to confront you because he's saying, I want to use you. Maybe it's something as simple, which is not simple, but as simple as greeting at the door. Maybe you've been convicted to do that. And I'll, I'll share a little story very quickly. And my husband and I, when we went back to church, we would argue literally from our house in the 15 minute drive all the way to church and the moment we would hit the sidewalk we would put on a good mask and we start to walk in because I'll tell you what the people that are sitting next to you you don't know the things that they're carrying they look really good on Sunday but they may be carrying burdens that you don't understand and as I crested through the door I would be greeted with someone who would do something that I learned later as I became a greeter they would do a look a touch and a word They'd look me in the eye and say, good morning, it's so good to see you, and give me a positive touch. I didn't have that that day. This is prior to my husband and I really turning our lives over to the Lord. We hadn't at that time. We just knew we needed to come to church. But the ministry that that did for me was to say, you're seen and that you're loved. It was so powerful. And then when I became a greeter, it was the thing that I would never forget. I remember, Veronica, how you were when you walked into this building. To look at someone in the eye and say, I see you, and I acknowledge that you are alive and that you're a human, and that I love you, and that I'm glad you're here because when you're here, it makes a difference for me. That is a huge ministry. People will negate the people on the, the driveway. You probably just drive by and they have their signs. And my husband and I feel like that is the most important ministry in this church. You know why? First of all, it's the most fun because you can do a lot of slides, flipping and stuff. We have fun when we do it. But really it's because of the testimonies we get to hear of people who said, I wasn't even going to go to church tonight. But there was this guy on the road and he was smiling and he waved me in and I came in and oh my goodness what God did. That ministry is huge. People make a determination about the church and the friendliness of the church within the first five minutes. That's literally the drive. My word. What is God calling you to do? Maybe it's a ministry. that you're like, oh, that can't be for me. We can't do that. He's confronting you right now because he wants you to do it. So let's take a moment. Let's bow our heads and pray. Maybe in this room, that's you. Maybe what I just described is you, that you have been called to something. There's just this, I know I should do this. I know I should serve this way. I know I should serve in kids. I know I should serve at New Carlisle. Hint, hint. I know <laughs> that I should do this. But this is what God is calling me to do. But you've been fighting it. You've been wrestling with them. If that's you, nobody is looking because everybody's eyes are closed. If that's you, would you throw your hand up in the air because I want to be able to pray for you. Just throw it up in the air. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You can put your hands down. Let's pray. Because even if you didn't throw your hand up in the air, I do believe that God calls us past our what we normally do. And so we're going to pray for that. So, dear Heavenly Father, you are so amazing. Thank you, God, for taking our broken pieces, just the little bit that we have, and making it into something beautiful. God, would you use us? We are called to go, to tell the world, to make disciples. And so God, would you call it? That call is so important. That mantle is so important. Would you use us? Thank you, God, for what you're going to do. Thank you for the birth 
of the ministries that are happening inside this room. Thank you for the call of God on the people inside of this room. Thank you, God, that you are calling people into ministry, into vocational ministry, into becoming a missionary. You are doing it, Lord, in this church. Thank you. And so, Lord, we offer our little so that you can extrapolate it and make it a lot. It's in your mighty name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Man, Mother's Day. Make sure that you buy your mother whatever she wants. <laughs> I say that so that it will reverberate to my children in New Carlisle. But I want to say one thing. I want you to know that maybe you came here today and you haven't heard a positive word and you haven't heard someone tell them that they love you. But I want you to know that I love you and that I see you and I'm so glad you're here. So go tell four other people and invite them to church. Have a great weekend, guys. Thank you for letting me speak.